evening and uh, as well, thanks and uh, of course thanks to Sasha and to all the organizers. I'm going to try, if you don't mind, I can stay back a bit further if it's better, but I'm going to try to speak without the microphone. Is that, does that work for people further up? Would you mind if I, I just try? Because I want to be able to move around a little bit. Uh, is that, seriously, can, are the acoustics good? Thanks. Great. If it gets set, uh, if I get too hoarse or it gets tiresome, I'll go back, you know, and we will. There's, they also handed me a walking mic so I can do, you know, uh, <laughs> I can do my rock and roll act. But, uh, I see some people have heard some of this material before right in front of me. Now, I thought there was going to be one, now there's two. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, here goes. Um, yes, it's a paper about a rush. And I suppose what uh, being in a rush has to do with time. And um, I'm coming to you uh, to deliver um, the slightly, I suppose, sad news that modernism is the literature of slowing down. Okay. Today, of course, we're all supposed to be in love with slowness. You know, slow food, slow travel, slow uh, living, right? And this befits Western aesthetics in which a contemplative distance, a static repose, is the viewer reader's ideal emplacement. So modernism's initial rebellious gesture was to renounce all of that, to vote for speed. From the futurists to let us, for the sake of Irishness, think of, say, Beckett's Endgame that was discussed so beautifully earlier today. Um, you know, where the armchair is on little casters. I mean, that's the trajectory <coughs> where the speeding car is replaced by a throne on little casters. And um, you have to think of modernism, what you have to think of modernism as is one giant pressing on the brakes on the part of high culture, at least high modernism. Over 40 years, modernism applied the brakes to its speed enthusiasm. And it did this by sending out again and again, in its works, the archaic figure of the flaneur, who embodied the adrenaline rush, but also then the stress of modernity. And what I will claim in this paper is that, <clears throat> with stress, modernism put the flaneur to a test of time. The flaneur embodies biotime. You know the flaneur, the walker in the city that's in basically every Western modernist work. Fiction, fiction. The flaneur embodies biotime, the time of your alive body, the time of your life. My question is, what does excitement, the excitement, for example, of living intensely, matter to time? This, I hope to show, was an obsessive question for modernism. So first, I want to display before you the modernist Soma text to suggest that the various modernisms, whatever their styles, got going in order to track with unprecedented attention the second-by-second -second somatic reactions to external stimuli of the characters displayed and to induce mirroring reactions in its readers or viewers. The various uh, literary modernisms are, to me anyway, now, so many textual machines designed to track the level of excitement of the subjects they portray and to incite a corresponding visceral response in the viewer or the reader. Um, hence, modernism, as I wrote in the thing, in the Precy, is a literature of the era between the patenting of adrenaline in 1901 and the discovery of stress, discovery of stress, in 1936. Modernism, I want to show, enacts a movement in modernity, and here is where it gets a crazy claim, but follow this one for a minute. I want to show that it enacts a movement in modernity to care much less about what was previously designated feeling, uh, which was valorized for its depth. You know, to have deep feeling was to live well. And instead, it gave that up uh, as the concern, which had been the concern of culture, and instead began to focus on human energy valorized for its intensity, and now considered mainly the domain of science. In this changeover of movement of the human subject's body and the rate of movement, speed, became the trope of the new, of the new exploration. 
In high modernism, Flannery, you know Flannery? That relatively slow, rattle along, Charlie Chaplin, you know Charlie Chaplin walk, right? Um, the, the modernist walk works as an experimental site for annotating human energy ex expenditure in observable movement and understanding why it matters. High modernism is no unalloyed celebration of arousal or excitement. Far from it. Flannery, I want to show you, subjects energy to time. And just to sort of sum up what I want to say, it starts out as a spatial, as a matter of traversing space, and ends up with this sort of time test. What I hope to make clear to you is that this energy preoccupation in modernism signals an unconscious awareness, towards the end of the paper, that not only is available space finite, or geospace finite, and has reached a limit, but that also time itself is beginning to be thought of as finite at this time, with its own limit in sight as well. So to use some very grand phrases, space, time, finitude, uh, modernism may mark the dawn, modernism intuiting this might mark the dawn of something like, which was beautifully discussed this afternoon with geology, a kind of ecological vision of space and time. Anyway, that's just a lot of what I would try to say. What we need, it, but just a few reflections first of all. What we need, I think, is a new materialist account of modernist time. Okay. And how do you achieve that? Um, what you have to do are fly by, number one, the nets of um, the, the, both the utilitarian and the utopian um, descriptions of time in modernism. Uh, the utilitarian accounts, or more likely from us, critiques of the utilitarian accounts, are recognisable for their narratives about saving time. You know that old sort of Protestant work ethic story? Um, they're the successors of the 19th century efficiency studies, whose aim was to make workers more productive and render speed no more than hyper productivity. Countering those, that, that rich story, um, are the sort of utopian versions in a line, of course, from Bergson to Deleuze, at least, which posit various escape routes from regimented time. Stories like the fold, the laden memory, of course, all the discussion about time as flow. These hold, to me anyway, hold out a mirage of an escape from the ever harder ground of utilitarian time. To discern beyond both of those a modern materialist time, I suppose, and I've marked out a lot here, but all I would want to say is we need to recast, we need a recast phenomenology of time. Otherwise, for the materialist, and let me quote you W.H. Auden, you know, you know what the most beautiful poem that W.H. Auden ever wrote? Time will say nothing, but I told you so. Time only knows the price we have to pay. Beautiful. Just that I've told you about that, and then you can go now. Just go look that up, <laughs> and you will be moved. Seriously. Uh, but time will say nothing, but I told you so. It only, time only knows the price we have to pay. And that's, that's sort of the tragedy of, of um, I think, to think, of, for me anyway, to think about time conceptually um, as a materialist, that's all one can say. You know, it's the sort of looking over one's shoulder, regretful glance at that entity called history, always. The changed, re <coughs> the changed relation of human energy and time, however, annotated in the modernist text, might be the index of the material, practical tackling of time and modernity. And the closest, because it's the closest the modern subject gets to experiencing time sensuously. Having said that, let me turn to energy, modernism, and time with a bit more specific focus. Um, Nietzsche, just to throw you a few notions first. Nietzsche, writing in the, one of the very last things he wrote before he truly went mad, said the following. What matters to modern man is no longer pleasure or displeasure, but excitement. And he added, I am not a man, I am dynamite. Einstein, writing just about the same time, uh, entitled his most famous essay outlining the special theory of relativity, he gave it the suggestive title, The Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. 
back in this paper too. That's important. Uh, <coughs> Ninety years later, the somewhat Nietzschean Paul Virilio, writing on what he called hyperactive man, notes, and I quote, the goal is no longer just to live better, comfortably consuming goods and medicine. One must now live more acutely. One must build up the nervous intensity of being alive. So my first point to you is that this nervous intensity is literally, in this argument anyway, the key concern of modernism. Now, what, in what form does this energy and the notion that the good life is that lived intensely enter modernist texts? Well, ask yourself, how do you know energy in other people? Or indeed, how do you know energy in yourself? How do you describe to yourself the fact that you have energy? Which you do quite a lot, think about it. <coughs> the answer, I suppose, is obviously through action. Yet, of course, modernism is incredibly short in action. So, <coughs> basically what happens in the modernist sort of imaginary text is that it develops its multiple strange language strategies to track, as I've just said, by minutely observing movement, the second-by-second -second somatic transformations of its characters as indices of energy expenditure. I'll just give you a few examples. Close readings of virtually every page of any modernist piece of fiction, trust me, go and do it, um, will reveal to you what I'm talking about at once. In the vast zone between omniscient narrative and interior stream of consciousness, soma annotation is modernist textuality stock and trade. But even third person narrative takes up the cause. One example out of millions I could come up with. In Mrs. Dalloway, for example, when Clarissa hears quote about the young man who killed himself, here's the sentence you get. Always her body went through it first, when she was told suddenly of an accident. Her dress flared, her body Bird. Did I read that again? Yeah, let me read that again. Always her body went through at first when she was told suddenly of an accident. Her dress flared, her body burned. It's a nice bit of surrealism, isn't it, Barry? In that surreal snapshot of the flaming dress and the burning body, we have really nothing more in the first instance than a medical literary recording of the physical reality arise in Clarissa's body temperature. Isn't that a flush? In Ulysses, to use the other example that some of you have heard me all about before, um, the notorious moment at the end of the Lestragonians episode where Bloom almost encounters his nemesis Blazes Boyle. When that happens, the sentence is, his heart quaked softly. His heart quaked softly. Quaked. It's a real word in English. <laughs> Maybe in Dutch as well. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's a real word. It's not, it, his heart didn't beat. It didn't pound. It didn't simply tick over, but it quaked. The flaming dress, the quaffing heart. It's Woods and Joyce's stunning exactitude about the physical symptoms of the body's small but vital change which is registered. In the rest of the Lestragonians passage, for example, every kind of narration is marshaled to continue this remarkable scientific medical recording of Bloom's symptoms, second by second. He blushes, we know that because he thinks wine in the face. His breath grows short, the quote is, the flutter of his breath came forth in short sighs. He grows feisty, he grows fidgety. We hear everything is his hands touch his searches in his pockets, and his heart begins to beat unbearably fast. He says, moment more, my heart. Plus, the sentences grow shorter, pounding too. Reading them palpitates us, gets us to empathize and physically experience his adrenaline rush. And that's a new thing in literature. I suppose a new thing in realism, perhaps. Um, you know, they didn't write like that before. My point is that the baseline of the narrative's concern in each case is no longer, 
as it would have been in Hardy, in James, or in Conrad, the significance, you know, implied by motivation. There's no analysis of feeling. There's certainly no analysis of judgment or of, of ethical issues um, or of character. All of that, which as we know slows down the narrative in Sir Henry James, is replaced now by the second to second as it happens reporting on alterations in bodily reactions to stimuli. The changeover, I'll give you one other example. The heart, his heart comes softly. Think of the famous last sentence of Ulysses. She says, yes, I will, yes, I will, yes. But why does she say that? Because the previous clause is, his heart was going like mad. You know, and his, he asked me with my eyes to ask again. And his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Okay? So if you read that whole last half page of Ulysses, it's not even clear if Bloom actually asked her to say yes, or what the question was. Uh, he may not even have spoken. It's his pounding heart that subsumes his words. And likewise, modernist textuality fluctuates at this interchange of energy annotation and language all the time. The modernist sentence, like an incredibly precise medical measuring device, records the exact oscillations of energy registered in physical changes in every subject. So I've gone on about that for perhaps too long, but I'll now move on. The reference I just made to medicine is intentional. The crucial question would be, why did modernism start doing this? And the answer, of course, usually is uh, there isn't a sort of a common hermeneutic to which the writer can appeal, so we've got to do something else. Uh, but for me, I would want to say instead that what you really have here is a cultural reaction to the colonization through the 19th century by science, by medicine, of what had previously been seen as a largely cultural concern, the topic of, say, sensibility. Significantly for the emergence of the literary flaneur, this perhaps began with the photographic stop action sequences of Muirbridge and Marais of human and animal movement. This interest in movement is a sign of life, and this is a very quick history of the medical interest in this topic. The interest in movement as a sign of life was finessed later in the century as medical researchers began to develop machines, an incredible array of, of Victorian machines. The ergonomic, I've got a list of them here, ergonomic monocycle, Angelo Mosso's ergograph, the beginnings of the, what do you call it, you know, the, the lie detector beginnings of the lie detector, to make ever more precise measurements, in Mosso's case, of the twitches of the human finger, you know, for example. And in 1886, Gilles de la Tourette, and you know, Tourette, a major figure in all of this, um, he, he put the wallpaper rolls on the floor and made his uh, patients walk on them, and he measured exactly the, the precise nature of their gait. And by the way, um, Balzac, not only wrote about fashion, he also wrote a whole similar essay on the gait. Quite, indeed, quite a, in the 1830s, I think it was as well. Um, here was a rapidly developing scientific interest in how emotional changes in the human body could be observed through small variations in human motion. At, as the subtlest change, such as blink, or the rise of the heartbeat, came to be measured, scientific attention moved on to finer gradations of excitability and especially signs of so-called nervous fatigue. And what's striking is they applied these not just to patients but to the whole culture very quickly. For example, um, George, Dr. George Beard's best-selling book, American Nervousness, a bestseller in America in 1872, was used extensively by George Simmel in, in a lot of in, you know, in his famous uh, urban descriptions. Now, from this firm, too, obviously, emerged modern, uh, modern psychiatry. Freud. But what we should remember is that the field of clinical psychological observation continued even more, you know, it was by no means forgotten when, when, uh, when modern psychiatry came along with the talking cure. And the, the, the kind of grand figures here are William James, first of all, whose most famous essay is called What is an Emotion? And what James says in that essay is that an emotion is not a thought you have that then you feel something about. It's a sensation upon the body that you perceive and then that is the emotion. So 
Yeah, it fits in with the thing I've been describing, if you think about that. Very striking distinction. His student was uh, Walter Cannon at Harvard, in, who a uh, great researcher right through the 20s. His most famous book is Bodily Changes in Pain, Hunger, Fear, and Rage of 1924 writing on the energizing influence of emotional excitement. So the 19th century attention to locomotion gave way to attention to the newly discovered glands, especially the adrenal gland and adrenaline. And if energetics in the 19th century had worried about fatigue, by the 1930s, 20th century had found its version in stress. Stress was described in detail by Hans Seeley in 1936. Stress is symptoms, hyperexcitability, where the human body cannot quite control its energies. Is turned against its own time efficiency, is stressed. Okay, that in brief is how mostly male scientists, building on human movement studies, colonized a whole new area of research, the terrain of emotions and feelings, which had up to then been left to culture, and largely, of course, cast as the concern of women. In this changeover, the model of emotion that saw deep feeling as more significant was forsaken for one of energetic reaction which valorized intensity. Further, culminating with stress, this science turned out very quickly to become, it was producing every few years uh, notions that became wildly diffused in popular culture and kind of taken for granted as true. You know, stress being the most famous one. I mean, we all use it as a phrase. It has this huge fascinating medical history. If you accept this story, then you can also see how the beleaguered cultural hinterland we call high modernist literature, um, inheriting a field celebrated for its, you know, intimate knowledge of feeling, literally had to scramble to catch up. This readaption to a new, to a now largely recast terrain of human energy is discernible in every modernist text. Ulysses, one vast symptomology of such nervous tics, rates of breathing, heartbeats, and so many other books too. Now, in the midst of science's takeover of the emotions, what does modernism, attempting to outdo science, and that it too is annotating bodily changes minutely, what does it achieve? Okay, in brief, modernist narrative, however attenuated, puts the new bioenergetics in context. It sketches not merely the observable expression of emotions as the doctors could, but the economy which structures that energy expenditure. It provides materials for the history of a new energy economy, of which humans are only a small part. That's the geologic and the, the, the ecologic uh, story. Every modernist fiction is a test case for the value of different intensities of human energy in given contexts. And these test cases almost invariably are staged around time. We should all take a California Zen-like break at this point. <laughs> Isn't it interesting watching me being stressed here, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to perform this sort of like, it's like the lyric poem, you know? I'm trying to embody it perfectly, but I'm, you know, this perfect union of the state I'm in and what I'm talking about. myself once more, just to add to my stress level. <laughs> Modernism is the literature of the era between the end of the patent thing of the Brethren in 1901 and the full account of stress given in 1936. In other words, it's the literature of the high point of the scientific medical focus um, on human energy, which such... Excuse me, I'm getting to relax now to me. Which um, saw human energy explored incredibly carefully as the index of, there were a whole new set of terms like quality of life. You know, what a frightening term that is. Or even the term well being, is another one that started floating off the surface in those years. I think actually quality of life was 70s sociology, as far as I can remember. But there's a set of these sort of new terms are all lurking around, you know, uh, this kind of thing. Adrenaline and stress name obviously moments in a continuum, um, but the difference between them 
also marks, between 1901 and 36, a sea change in how science had thought about a human nature. The scientists moved from an unabashed celebration of the desirability of more and more energy in living organisms, as signified by the term adrenaline, to an implied understanding that human energy existed in an environment of other energies, of which it was one component of an economy of energies, as signified by the term stress. Modernist literatures on parallel attention to human energy in the same years followed, in fact, a similar trajectory. You know that path from Maranetti to, to Decadence, right? Uh, as modernist texts tested the implications of the energetics advanced by the scientists. So let me begin with adrenaline. Or let me tell you about adrenaline for a few minutes. Um, it's a silly thing to say before you introduce it, it's fascinating, but I swear to you it is. Adrenaline, uh, I think one of the best lines I read about adrenaline is a professor from, I think it was the University of Michigan, a, a doctor, and his line was, a faint air of scandal has always seemed to hang over adrenaline. Okay? And I don't know if any of you know the novel Tono Bungay about, you know, selling patent medicines. Patent medicines in 1900 were the iPhones of today, you know? There were vast fortunes to be made. And uh, people were still gullible, but new discoveries were being made. And um, adrenaline, the product, an isolated secretion of the adrenal gland, was patented, and the word itself was copyrighted by, and excuse my awful pronunciation, uh, Jokichi Takamine, a Japanese chemist who was one of the first Japanese people to study what was then called the foreign sciences in Japan. He was sent to Glasgow and then to America to represent Japan at one of those world exhibitions. He stayed. And while in Japan, he had discovered, he had been researching, you know, sake, how it's, how it's uh, fermented, and he discovered an enzyme which he brought to a company in America called Park Davis. They were the beginnings of Big Pharma. I think they still exist. And they said they could market this enzyme as a stomach upset. Uh, medicine. They did so, and he, he became an incredibly rich man in a few years. Okay? <clears throat> so he looked for others. And he went to Johns Hopkins University where they were exploring the pituitary gland, gland and they gave him a big welcome. And he went back to New York and he patented adrenaline. And he patented the word, and he was immediately sued by Johns Hopkins University, who claimed he had stolen the idea. And this is a, a, a huge case in medical copyright law, even today. This is what the foundation of what. Uh, among other things that he did was he's responsible for the cherry trees on the mall in Washington, D.C. He actually paid for those later in life. Um, but anyway, he brought his adrenaline to Park Davis. They started marketing it as the complete new wonder drug, uh, with reason. And he, he became, he was already immensely rich, he became richer still. Uh, adrenaline, um, well, in the early 20th century, was widely popular and very famous. For example, the boxer Gene Tunney claimed he took it before every fight. You could, you know, you could buy it. Um, it was sold, it was sort of the Red Bull of its day. It was, so, except better, it was sold as a miracle drug for things like asthma and allergies. It was injected, in fact it still is injected, uh, for people who've had heart attacks to try to revive them. And um, there's a lot of other brilliant things that it did, especially in relation to surgery. But it was also marketed for tons of illnesses um, for which it was no use whatsoever. In fact, probably, you know, like ephedrine, etc., probably very bad for it. Okay, in fact, ephedrine is the word that came in because he had uh, patented uh, the word adrenaline, so they couldn't use it. So I understand it. Moreover, in the hands of Walter Cannon, who I mentioned already, um, its role was kind of narrated. Walter Cannon came along and told the story of adrenaline as the story famously of fight or flight. You've heard that phrase, that response. So that it entered the popular imagination as a dream of a burst of energy which countered lethargy with embodied aggression, intense alertness and sensitivity. You know? Or it could, as flight, it could stimulate fear, a horror pre-consciously sensed in the body, a visceral experience of terror. 
Adrenaline's launch not only involved a perfect storm of modern medicine, university research, hucksterism, the mass media, copyright law, immense amounts of money, but it also encapsulated the new science-driven account of human life, and selfhood too, as energetic rather than as a fount of deep feeling. Consider flight or fight. Feeling could now only be known, and perhaps experienced, as physical bodily movement, you know, fight or flight. In what form did this enter, now, in what form did this enter the purview of modernist literature? <clears throat> Were there adrenaline novels? Was there adrenaline reading? See how dull reading seemed pretty fast? You know, they had, they had just invented, for example, uh, the roller coaster, you know, which in many ways was the beginning of the video game. And the novel has been in shock since, you know, I suppose. Were there adrenaline novels? <coughs> For me, until now, yeah, I try to keep this next bit very brief. The most convincing critical account of the modernist aesthetic project in fiction involves problematizing consumption. The novel, The Bourgeois Vertical, <coughs> had to tackle the new mass bourgeois pleasure of the late 19th century, at least since Balzac and fashion, which we heard so nicely about yesterday, of consumerism. Now, just, I hope you all know this story, but let me sketch it for you quickly. Read via Marx, the commodity, in its allure, acted to deaden affect and consciousness. Right? You know, the, the story of replication. Commodification, with its surface glamour, obscures, you know, when you buy the Hermes bag, you don't know who made it. You're being asked to buy the surface glamour. Okay? You therefore acquiesce to a hoodwink which on a mass scale is what we call reification. <laughs> Not a quick definition of reification <laughs> in those standards. Anyway, uh, now this regime of consumption then set the scene for modernist ennui, you know, the familiar story, for modernist, um, the blasé attitude, etc., etc., and you know, all the things that Eliot hated. Um, and even more, I suppose, um, you can go all the way up to the phrase, the death of affect, you know? Of our of Frederick Jameson, who was mentioned as well yesterday, and um, you know the idea that, that the whole story has been a story of, of, of the decaying ability to have affect, which would seem to be the exact opposite story from what I'm telling you, right? You know, and it's the tip, it's the basis of, of almost all our narratives about modernism even still, I think. Okay, now, but along, and I think the death of affect is a true. I believe it. I, I, I agree. I agree, of course, but alongside it, whether as utopian impulse or something more, the new obsessive interest of modernist prose is in energetics. You know, always her body went through it first, the quapping heart, or his heart going like mad. You know, both Ulysses and Mrs. Dalloway start, their main characters have a shock. It's the first thing they do in both books, right? Um, but by the end, both, for both of them, their somatic, sensational, energetic lives are revealed. And I want to claim, I suppose, that the appearance of these energies is, is the registration of somatic, or of energetic, all too human intensities as a kind of a new order of human well-being that we should take very seriously in its own terms. But what does it signify? To answer, I'm going to, don't be scared, I'm going to have a very brief excursus into phrase, the words I wrote here are space and time. <laughs> so okay, let me go back then to Jameson. For Jameson, modernist literature is that, of course, of the age of empire. So that the invisible real work that went into making the commodity was actually done far away in the colony. And to him, in his account, modernism was unconsciously registering the waning of affect, or the Western, that that implied. Thus, Jameson can show that what he sees as affect's fade out was just a problem for the Western consumer <laughs> and reader. Okay? What he also gets to do is make the problem of the death of affect one of political geography, that is, one of space the geopolitical organization of space. But in brief, I'm here to tell you that we can take his idea a lot further, okay? When we get to 
time. Because what Jameson admits, omits rather, <laughs> is that it was precisely at the modernist moment that the age of colonization and the whole imaginary involving distance and space it fostered was ending, precisely in fact in 1901. There's the famous Mackinder moment when another interesting character named Halford Mackinder wrote a famous essay, beloved of political scientists, where he pointed out, among other things, that the whole world had finally been mapped, you know, and, and colonized. The limit of global spatial expansion and the limit of the spatial imagination of heterotopic space, all those fantasies of, of, of adventure in other spaces, they were over because that limit had been reached. And in a way, that's the most important thing still in relation to space in, in the 20th century for me. Space and all the resources that exist in it were now at once seen to be finite. But you have the birth of ecology right at that moment, the modern ecology. And of course, the obvious next point is that time was not quite limited by any such logic. In the imaginary and cultural realms, the fantastic shifted instantly, or pretty instantly, and it's strange, to time. You know, they stopped writing those, who was the German who wrote all those boys in Africa novels, what was his name? You know, the one, you know those boys' adventure novels in the late 19th century? Oh, Haggard? You know, Ryder Haggard in England, absolutely. You know. um, but even Kipling, etc. Um, they gave up those kind of uh, books. The, the fantastic imagination shifted either to antiquarianism, you know, the whole world of village history societies, right? You know, Thomas Hardy, pretty much explained. Um, uh, was at one side, and also, of course, modernist futurologies, like science fiction. You know. Philip K. Dick was probably born in 1901 as well. The popularity of Flannery in modernist works can be understood in these terms. Flannery worked as a switching mechanism in which the imagination of space, the space is traversed by the Flannery, gets replaced by stress, which is a problematic of time. And so, I'm nearly done. I want to talk a little bit about stress and the discovery of stress. And like adrenaline, stress came forth unsullied from the research laboratory. First deduced by Cannon, it was theorized and instantly popularized worldwide as one of the most pervasive accounts of human well-being in, since then by a Hungarian named Hans Selmy. S-E-L-Y-E? Is there any Hungarian? I was in Budapest and I was reading that the inventor of the Rubrics Cube was from Budapest. But then I was thinking of this man and I was wondering is there any connection? You know, it's, the Rubrics Cube is, is it postmodern or modern? You know the way that the, you know, the, 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 the crossword, for example, is a modernist text. You know, it was a modernist invention. The Rubrics Cube is sort of like the crossword, but a little more abstract. Maybe like 50s, you know, 50s abstract expressions. <laughs> Anyway, so is that. Stress is the seminal invention of the whole medical scientific takeover of the emotions. And it just instantly entered popular, popular culture, you know, becoming the most mundane of sort of ideas. It's assuredly, it is perhaps in relation to the emotions, it's the, it is the modernist invention in relation to the emotions. Nothing to do with literature at all, notice. Yet it's almost never been mentioned by modernist scholars, at least not in English, right? other languages. I don't know that. Uh, stress takes the notion of an adre adrenaline rush that results from a fearful reaction to an external stimulus and expands that story of arousal. It expands it into a complex cascade of scenarios now built around a hypotheticized normal rhythm of human existence, which he called, said he called the human adaption syndrome. It, it, this implies that we need stress to engage our sensations. Stress um, makes us respond with energy. Yet too much stress leads to what he called an alarm state, where one panics, turns agitated, upset, tense, becomes oversensitive. In short, unable to manage the expenditure of the body's energy in time. Stress is impatience. Stress is impatience turned physiological. And there's a project for somebody, a history of impatience. Uh, imprinted on uh, the body 
is the feeling that you don't have enough time. That's one definition of stress. By Leopold Bloom, Gregor Samsa, Lyons Ashenbach, name your favorite marvelous character. Are they stressed? Of course they are. Virtually all the great modernist works are about stress. Right. Yet the last thing we'd want to do is reduce them to case studies for Hans Selye or Claude Bernard, another figure I didn't mention before in Paris. Rather, modernism stress cases allow us to grasp why stress became the very base descriptor of 20th century life. And it has everything to do, now that space as imaginative outlet is foreclosed, with our modern sense of how we as humans handle time. There's a few pages left, I'm sorry. Can you bear with me for a few minutes more? It's two and a half. I've had little stuff. Reconsider adrenaline and Gene Tunney taking it before each boxing match. It's flight or fight, a fight or flight narrative, had a pre-war, pre-First World War, masculine, active cast. It was futurist or Kipling-esque daring do, retold by medicine. The new dream of an intensely lived life would be available to all. Everybody could. You know, there was wonderful new slang at that time for what, what was going to people were going to get. Like the word jazzed, for example. Or the great English word vim. They were all going to have vim. Nobody uses that word at all anymore. Um, it's these modernist words that just lasted for when they were needed and then disappeared. Uh, this new human velocity, of course, will be propelled by the new technologies of the day. You know, when I wrote about speed and cars, sort of, what I realized at this, that this speed was very literal. You know, by the late 20s, a speed of between 30 and 60 miles an hour, by 1925, was seen as normal, attainable. It was automobile speed. Automobile speed is almost like the speed of modernism. Then, however, by 1936, you have Selly's stress, an altogether less wholeheartedly optimistic vision of, the, of human energy. It's a post-1929, post-Wall Street crash uh, version of energy expenditure as frustrating almost to the point of malfunction. Stress is a theory of the terrors of overstimulation. And if in the first years of the century, high culture was scrambling to keep up with the tropes thrown up by science, one senses that 30 years later with stress, high culture had gotten there already. If most high culture texts are about stress without knowing it, because the idea or the term had not been invented yet, they fear an overgeneration of human energy, an excess of it. And this fear is best epitomized by that figure of the planner who is slower and takes more time than he or she needs to, than modernity warrants. For the flaneurs of modernism, flanery takes place in labyrinths, from which in every case they can only possibly escape to an airless home. With space foreclosed, time potentially opens and provides an escape route. But once they are stressed, that is once the original adrenaline rush that propelled each of them, think of Bloom and Mrs. Dalloway, initially, or Ashenbach, initially onto the street, once that encounters literally too much stimulation, they become plodders, they slow down. Flaneria's trope sets its speed at the rate of this plot. The flaneur's speed, or rather his or her slowness, is an index of the stress of modernity. It slows down and rations human energy to the rhythm of the walk. It thus dissipates impatience, the frustration of being slowed, below the rush we consider our rightful speed, it aestheticizes frustration into a slower rhythm. Flannery in high fiction functions not unlike another modernist invention, the slow motion sequence in film. Flannery, at the pace deemed seemly in the Victorian world of Louis Bridge and Marais, is an archaic holdover of an earlier biospeed offered <coughs> a modernist afterlife. 
It makes relentlessly fast-forward modernity palpable for high culture. Literally, it bought it time. There's one final kick I want to introduce you to. I already told you how the end of the sense of blank global space precipitated the dreams of alternative worlds situated in the past and the future. You know, chrono topia, we could call it that. The whole world had been colonized, and now space was imagined and experienced, how it was experienced and imagined at every level changed, because now it was finite. Just a final question, did, the, did time reach a similar limit in any way in the 20th century? According to my old hero, Paul Virilio, who of course you can't trust, but he's worth <laughs> entertaining, it did. At the moment of the invention of the atomic bomb, which coincided with the discovery of the speed of light as absolute speed. And this was roughly, you know, the years of World War II, between 1940 and 45, right after the invention of stress. So let's extend my opening hypothesis. Modernism began with the realization that the whole world had been mapped and that the limit of global space had been reached. At that point, the adrenaline aesthetic, the potential dream of human energy at speed, developed. Then that's how it began. Then modernism ended at the moment when it was somehow intuited that there was a limit to this speed in the absolute speed of light. A moment when the subjective experience of time through energy, speed, and movement was tempered by the breaking, the accelerating narrative of stress. Modernist texts aestheticizing stress into the relatively regular, repetitive rhythm of flannery stage the way in which the imaginative implications of the new sense of a finite geospace sentence, were further confounded by the sense that a limit of time was being reached as well. Through Flannery, every modernist text slows down, breaks, at the discovery, breaking mechanism, at the discovery that there's no future. Just leave you with that thought. Do you know there's a song, there's no future, no future, the clash, about 50 years after that? Um, very good song, very fast. Um, but with Molly, Molly Bloom or Clarissa Dalloway or Ashenbach or whomever, uh, having only their memories, we can say that modernism, slow as it is, also got there first. of energy in the 19th and 20th century as possibly being related to a culture of opiates shifting from a culture of, to a culture of narcotics within the 20th century. Uh, so, what was the phrase? What was the first phrase? Uh, a culture of opiates. So the 19th Opiates century. to narcotics. Exactly. Oh, well, fascinating, yeah. And um, of course it fits into, I think one could fit that uh, story, especially into the, you know, adrenaline as a product, as, a, as itself a stimulant or whatever, you know, it's like in, in the history, it includes coffee, for example, in the 18th century, at the cafe house and everything. From opiates to 
I don't know enough about narcotics to say, which is perhaps good. <laughs> So I think that there's a sort of broader cultural shift in this time to a need to adapt to temporality changes. And so um, I think there's a lot within the medical history that could be interesting. And there's obviously some relation to imaginativeness, you know, to what sort of visions, you, you know, the, 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 the visionary possibilities presumably of opiates are greater than exactly. the sensation, it, you, then you move to the sensational possibilities of the narcotic, as I understand it anyway. And, you know, that again would, would fit very well with what I am trying to say uh, in the story I'm claiming. Very much so, yes. Um, <coughs> so thank you, thank you. Huh? Uh, thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering about um, if we brought his conversion hysteria into the argument, because that's where okay. somatization... That's yes. where somatization yes. is, yes. is happening. But it seems there that feeling or affect is converted into physiological response through image or symbol or linguistic term. And your stress model seems to do away with that. There isn't the mediation of um, some kind of projective imaginary or linguistic Ex or symbolic realm. Yes. But then what, what, how does mediation <coughs> happen? How does... How do, if, we, if we think of psyche to soma, if we can think in that way, then what would mediate it? I mean, Freud has an answer to that, which, you know, what would, what would the new answer be, I suppose? Well, I give the usual, I attribute of the usual reply, it's a fantastic question. <laughs> 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 to which, of course, I don't know the answer. I mean, to lob it back, why would there, I mean, maybe the point is there isn't a mediation. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm, mm -hmm. or the, yes, and, and then if there isn't a mediation. And that raises yeah. all kinds of. Sure, but then if there, isn't a medi if there isn't a mediation, then perhaps we're more in the realm of something like the human motor. Yes. I mean, Ravenbach's of answer course, to I mean, that, of but that's not quite what you want to Well, I was trying to escape from Ravenbach by, by, with that little paragraph in the beginning about the utilitarian approach. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I see the, I think I see the, the vast significance of your question, um, you know. Um, which, to put it in some, another way, would be, to, to continue the last one, would be something like, is there any possibility for imaginativeness mm. in this scenario, mm. you know? Um, obviously, the texts themselves are fictions, all of them, you know. And maybe this comes back to those things about realism and that, uh, mm. you know. Um, I just, I, obviously, hysteria and everything and all of that, you know, to Reth, to Charcot, to, to Freud, it all happened in a particular sort of knot in mm. Paris, this Claude Bernard, uh, you know, that again, I don't. I am completely know nothing once you get onto the anything that might be called you know Freudianism really, mm -hmm. um, which obviously has been immensely attractive to us all, uh, to to lots of you know. Um, so how to? This, I suppose the easiest way would be to ask how to escape the Rabenbach mm -hmm. story. Well. It's too difficult at this moment. I mean, it, it really is, I think that, because that story is, uh, I think a lot of the books end up with some version of that one, you know, that, I, that books I like about, uh, you know, um, the cultural histories of space and uh, cultural histories of, of time, in particular, mm. time management uh, in relation to, to human beings. Um, you know, they tell stories about the grind of time and how it's, you know, enhanced or not. Um, but this sort of much more uh, fundamental question of, of can we think our way imaginatively out of this conundrum? I, I mean, well, one thing I worry about in, my, in what I've said is that I'm doing down high culture. So perhaps in some marginal zone of pop culture, they are discovering something. Mm -hmm. And again, what do I know? Does that, you know, I mean, I, that might be the answer. In this, or maybe, maybe it's something in film. 
you know, I, I get this glancing thing about the, 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 the technical you know, um, improvements there. But um, I, I suppose on, in, in terms of what I'm saying, I am just reading modernism as a kind of a hyper-medical realism, which has to be incredibly limiting. So there has to be all kinds of other fascinating uh, things that are going on there formally, if nothing else, that uh, do more than just make you yourself be a somatic reader, which is what I was basically all I was saying. Because I think it's, that needs to be noticed. That they're, they're, the nature of, yeah, very easily the nature of reading has changed, but to try and specify that, um, I think it's beginning to think about that. Yes? Um, I know you've said that you can pick up a million and one examples of work. Are there any that you are just uh, posing? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> no, I just asked my questions wouldn't be so specific. I'm going to ask you, you know, to think about one that seems to me, uh, it's been a couple of years since I read it, but uh, Thomas Mallory's uh, Magic Mountain. Oh, well, um, and, and more you mentioned this you know. sort of hyper um, <coughs> medical history that you're just describing, or literary genre, yeah. which is, is being used to completely different means. I would say the slow, I mean, the book to me is all about slowing down. I mean, I think about those rituals of um, taking one's um, fever, the, the wrapping in, um, in blankets, um, as offering, um, up until the very, I guess, the last paragraph of the book, when suddenly things are speeding up and we're in the battlefield. Um, what, what did you make of this attention to bodily function, to heart rate, to, yeah. I seem to be not answering any question, but I, 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 I'm just in this room, much too scared to try to give a half a paragraph reading of Magic Mountain to you. I'm sure I could twist it in some way to suit my own interest. <laughs> because there's a whole thing about, um, you know, you know, I could, for example, I could talk about T.S. Eliot, and that the languor in Eliot, for example, let us go then, you and I, you know, is actually perversely an incitement you know, it's, it's an enactment of frustration. And therefore, an insight, it, 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 it's got within it the, the dynamic that I'm talking about between adrenaline and stress, uh, except in the different quotient. Now, the, another side point that I could make a little joke about is there are national energies, national bodies. This whole material wasn't just medical, and as we know, medicine itself, like the whole Japanese in America story, which is so interesting, you know? Uh, there are national narratives of all of this. So a simple answer to you would be, well, he was German, of course, you know. So there's a particular, the, the rhythm in German lit that he had as a resource to develop was somehow, you know, what one country had a sort of a, you know, Caribbean jazz rhythm as its background, another one had a, a much more solace. I mean, I think the issue of rhythm is really interesting. You know, literally how your own heartbeat matches up with your reading. If you want, if it's got to be a somatic reading. They're just scattered. Um, yes? <laughs> yes? Uh, thinking back into sort of on the notion of uh, hypermedical realism, uh, I really like the way that you sort of situate stress as, uh, as you said, in patients' terms, physiologically. notions where stress is sort of induced by overstimulation um, and the notion that stress is both healthy as a coping mechanism yes. but can also turn pathological yeah. um, and I was wondering if you could sort of explore how that sort of ties into your notion. Oh no, it's very, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and I mean, you know, you just Google stress, you know, there's a vast literature on this in at all levels of medicine, from the most serious to, to you know, somebody who sets up at a corner selling something. Um, yes, I mean, what you, you summed up rather well, I think, the, the general outlines of the, of the story, that, um, uh, you know, um, stress is absolutely, the, 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 the narrative of stress, anyway, is that it's absolutely necessary, right? That, you know, to induce any movement in a living organism, there has to be a stress, okay? But then you, 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 um, you turn that around and you sort of somehow internalize. Again, I'm not, I'm not uh, 
I'm just thinking of this term in, in our lives, you know, in, in, in pop culture. And you then turn it into sort of a descriptor of not the stress, not the, the act of being stressed by an outside stimulus, but the, the, um, the interior state. And almost all this, that's negative, right? That is negative. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, sorry. The, um, the whole sort of, you know, the image of that basic one cell organism and how we know it's alive or not is kind of at the, is the simplest way to think about all this. We know it's alive. How do we know that cell is alive as opposed to the cell of one of those rocks we, we heard about this afternoon, how beautiful it is? You know, it, it, can, it has this ability to move, okay, right? Um, so what does stress become? It's something like, yes, agitated movement that to us does not look what? Graceful? You know, lots of aesthetic character. You know, where do you, where do you draw the line you, you, you set up? Is actually a, a, perhaps a, a very fascinating terrain there. Where perhaps, you know, perhaps that's where, perhaps, the, the, perhaps that's the sort of mediation that something can happen in, you know. Does that begin to just trouble the waters a tiny bit? But it's also, I mean, the other side of it is, I mean, think about what a reductive view of life this is. Or, we were talking about humanism earlier in the day. Is this what humanism has wrought? There's one cell, and is it alive or not? You know, all of the mediations, the thousands of years of mediations in so many countries. You know, aren't they some use? <laughs> That's rather grand way to put it. But I mean, in many ways, they're, you know, the, the scientists are, are saying no. You know, I think, or at least the way they're thinking. I mean, I don't know, probably, you, for example, if you're working in medicine, you probably know a lot more than I about how scientists construct their narratives. And often in a very, in a strikingly simplistic way, but by our, by our rights. You know? Anyway. And final question. Oh, yes. Is that for me? That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, thanks. This is uh, a wonderful, wonderful paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, I was just, um, a few questions cropped up in my mind as I, I was listening. Um, and going back to Laura's question here, and I know you, <laughs> you didn't really have an answer, but you sort of sketched like a, a sort of some kind of development from late 19th century obsession with fatigue and then sort of moving on to stress. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking about neurasthenia, which of course yeah, was, was a diagnosis uh, yeah. at the time, and of course central, um, absolutely central in Freud. And yes. so that was just, I was sort of thinking to myself, is this the same thing, or is it, you know, is it just diff a very different discourse, or is it similar? And another thing, um, it sort of, um, Excitation. I was thinking about Flaubert, and um, there are all these um, writers and poets and artists that are very interested in sort of using various kinds of uh, uh, drugs and writing about that. And right. Flaubert did too, and Benjamin did, and yeah, sort yeah. of like this neurological uh, excitement. Yes, 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 yes. You know, is that different or? So, the, you know, well, no, it sort of different. confirms what you're talking about, that there's a lot of interest in, you know, what's sort of happening. Yes. Um, I, I mean, in the, I wrote another... I, I mean, suggestion too, but... Please, so please, please. But, so. Oh, maybe it's all about hormones. Oh, well. <laughs> maybe it's not about stress, but the I'm discovery... Of stress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the gland modernism. That's the new kind of sort of... Yeah. The hormonal turn in modernist studies. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget what you heard it first. Uh, is, it, is this in keeping with the original uh, you know, contribution now? Um, <laughs> do you want me to answer any of these things? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I suppose speaking of neurasthenia, we should all just go for a drink. But um, 
Yeah, you, yes, but I, I think the phrase was nervous fatigue, you know. And that was, of course, that came out of, to the extent I remember, it came out of, that book, American Nervousness, is about this, basically. Surely one of the greatest titles in the 19th century, American Nervousness. But, uh, but um, uh, you know, a medical pop culture book. Uh, and um, I don't remember the full description. But presumably, of course, it was a, a, a predecessor to stress. But yes, there is some idea that that whole story sort of devolved into full scale, what we'd now call bipo understanding bipolarity or things like that. Whereas sort of descriptors of normal people being upset with life in the normal humdrum way <laughs> move to stress, you know? Um, so in that sense, neurasthenia probably is a heck of a lot more interesting, but not for my purposes, you know? Um, uh, what was the other, oh, the 19th century, yes. Well, of course, you know, as I told you, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I have a longer thing on, on just Flannery itself that I was trying to understand from all of it. If you're free to write, I have them. And really, Balzac was the one I, when we started last night, I was so struck. I thought, my God, he's, he was there with so many. He had the, he was playing the organ in every note, you know? Because he wrote a similar, very obscure a document called, um, it's, in English, it's the gauge. You know, how you walk. It's utterly fascinating, which of course we all know, but we don't discuss it so much anymore. How everybody, you know, like your fingerprint, you have a way of walking that, you know, is it tied to all kinds of stereotypes and all kinds of gender stories. And you know, if my, if my gait was a little feminine, for example, that's a problem. You know? Or we used to have the teacher in school who would do the opposite. The boys weren't supposed to do this kind of, you know? But, but, but he wrote this, you know, 80 or 90 pages on on that particular movement alone. You know. And right there you could see the beginnings of this before, before those photographers. I don't know. There must be some whole 18th century story too of, of observation. Obviously the story of observation in medicine here, of looking at live bodies as the way to, uh, to, to, to diagnose. Okay? Um, the drugs. It's funny how you're all mentioning drugs, huh? <laughs> uh, I haven't really thought about that too much myself, you know. Uh, but um, uh, isn't that where we're all headed, you know, to more and more of those kind of, as they say, interventions? Um, and um, uh, I mean, does it lead to some, I mean, has the time story, you know, is there such a thing as sort of bio-time? I mean, simple facts like we hope to live longer, you know, all those stories, right? And, you know, obviously changes the way we think about, you know, time periods and everything. Um, but, but this idea of intensity is actually very hard, of course. To, I think we all vaguely know what I'm going on about. But if I asked you all to define it, you know, we'd come up with an awful lot of different, you know, what does it mean to live a life intensely, actually? You know, if, if the narcotic or the, the speed, you know, the drug is about being more intense, is this about pleasure anymore? I mean, in a way, have we gone beyond the whole story of pleasure and desire? Is, is perhaps if we're doing a mediating thing, you know, we still have to talk about pleasure, desire. In a way, are we gone beyond those two? You know, is that kind of the turn of the century not? There was earlier, whatever. There was, uh, y you know, uh, are we at some other level where, you know, the death of affect, we, you know, what's supposed to happen? We take the death of affect for granted. Well, at, but at some secret level, we as humans are committed to never accepting the death of but maybe we should. Maybe we actually live in some other way. You know, maybe we're the ones who are living in the past. And it's, it's frightening. That's what I was trying to say. I can't answer your question. It's a very frightening prospect, I think, that life would be what we have been taught all our lives as humanists to think of it utterly banal in that way. Right? We would all become 
you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's ingesting drugs, you know, making sure our body movements were perfect and our bodies were perfect too, and there'd be nothing else except our physical reactions to show that we're alive and living intensely. That would be pure intensity, wouldn't it? That would be a lyrical intensity, like a good lyric poem. So that's how I'm frightened. <laughs> Let's all go to drink. This is the Irish poem. <laughs> yes, we have to end on this frightening note.